and welcome to Lunchtime Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzongo. Here's what's coming up on the program right now. Eight individuals are now arguably most wanted in the country in the alleged killing of 17 soldiers in Okwama community on March the 15th who are on a peace mission. Embattled national chairman of the Labour Party, Julius Abure, re-elected in the contentious national convention held in Inewi, in Anambra State. And President Bola Tinubu inaugurates Presidential Economic Coordinating Council and the Economic Management Team Emergency Tax Force to harmonize efforts at revamping the nation's economy. Thanks again for joining us. Let's begin today's program by telling you that hours ago, eight individuals, including seven men and a woman, have now been declared wanted by the military in connection with the alleged killing of 17 soldiers in Okwama community of Delta State who have now been laid to rest. The Director of Defense Media Operations, Major General Edward Buba, is asking Nigerians, especially residents of Delta State and adjoining states, to assist the military with credible information that will lead to the arrest of eight persons allegedly responsible for the killings of the soldiers. Those declared wanted are Professor Ekpeko Ato and Dawei Dennis Bakiri, Akewuru Daniel Omotego, also known as Amagbem, Akata Malawa David, Sinclair Oliki, Clement Ikolo, Ogene Klowe, and Ruben Baro, as well as Igoli Ebi. Major General Buba gave the update at a news conference in Abuja. When you look at our armed forces, our armed forces is a force for good. We are deployed across the country for a reason. And that reason is obvious to all, should be obvious to all, for the protection of our citizens and the restoration of peace where there is none. What we do in a situation where the extension is to de-escalate it. And when it has gone out of hand, we contain it to make sure it doesn't spread. So what has happened in Delta must never repeat itself. And it is for that reason that we have put out this banner of eight persons, including a woman, as wanted persons. <laughs> We will do whatever it takes to get these people. If we need to put the bounty on their head, we will do that. And we encourage citizens, particularly those in Delta State, to assist in the investigation by flushing these persons out. And let's also tell you that the president, Bola Tinubu, has vowed to fish out the perpetrators of the Okwama killings on March the 14th, 15th, rather, in Ugali South, local government area of Delta State. The president, who was a special guest at the burial ceremony of the military men, commended uh, the military for their restraint so far. On behalf of a grateful nation, we honor the sacrifice of Ali and the other gallant patriots who died that day. They will forever be remembered as heroes who answered the call of duty and paid the ultimate price. Each man now belongs to the hallowed list of service men and women who defended our country and protected their fellow Nigerians, not minding the risk to their own lives. They have all been awarded now. A posthumous national honor. The four gallant officers have been accorded the award 
of members of the Order of Niger, M-O-N. The 13 courageous soldiers who also lost their lives have been awarded the officers of the Federal Republic Medal. President of Nigeria, Bola Tinubu. Let's move on now to other stories. Uh, the released students of Lee Primary and Government Secondary School, Koriga in Chikun, local government area of Kaduna State, have been reunited with their parents three days after they were freed by their abductors. The children were handed over to the families on Wednesday by the Secretary to the Kaduna State Government on behalf of Governor Ubasani. Parents of the rescued children were excited and relieved to reunite uh, with their words after more than two weeks of anxiety as they commended the efforts of the security agencies and the intervention of the Kaduna State Government in rescuing the kidnapped children. And now to some politics. Despite controversies and protests, Mr. Julius Abure has been re-elected the national chairman of the Labour Party by 387 delegates at the 2024 National Convention of the Party in Inewi, in Anambra State. The chairman of the National Convention and Deputy Governor of Abia State, Mr. Ike Chiku Emetu, declared him winner after delegates had affirmed him as the party's president, a chairman, I should say, although some top leaders of the party were not present at the convention. I want to express my deepest appreciation and gratitude to all the delegates to this national convention for the trust and the confidence reposed in us to continue as members of the National Republic Committee. I also want to appreciate our own Deputy Governor and through him to all others from Abia State who came to assist us in giving life to this program today. Still talking issues relating to party politics and labor union, the president of the Trade Union Congress, Mr. Festo Susifo, is asking the re-elected chairman of the Labor Party, Mr. Julius Abure, and the leadership of the Nigeria Labor Congress to meet on how to iron out their differences and move the party forward. Mr. Susifo, who was speaking on our political program, Politics Today, explains that both parties have contributed to making Labor Party known and should cooperate to build it. We think that the labor movement has to do much more rather than, I mean, uh, sound bites here and there. We need to do much more if we think that our labor party belongs to us. What have we done? How many members have we mobilized into labor party in the last one, two, three, four years? Those should be the cross. Because if we don't mobilize people into that party, if we don't register one, two, three, four million of our members into that party, then some other people are doing it. It is difficult for us to, consistent, to consistently say that the certificate of registration of a party lies under our bed. So my encouragement is that Labour, uh, I mean, uh, Labour Party as it stands today, yes, it was uh, registered by uh, NLC as claimed. The certificate is there, but all stakeholders need to sit down together and harmonize on the way forward. As Abure has emerged today, I, we, I, I just want to uh, appeal to him that he should be magnanimous in victory by calling all the stakeholders together, everybody to sit down and itemize and determine the way forward regarding the party. Let's now talk about the issues surrounding the economy, where the presidency has announced the establishment of the Presidential Economic Coordinating or Coordinating Council, or Coordination Council as it is called, and the creation of the Economic Management Team Emergency Tax Force. A statement by the Special Advisor on Media and Publicity to the President, Mr. Ajurin Galali, outlined the membership of the PECC as the President who will chair the committee. The Vice President, Kashim Shatima, will be the Vice Chairman. Also on the Council is the President of the Nigerian Senate, uh, the Chairman of the Nigeria's Governors Forum, Coordinating Minister for the Economy and Minister of Finance, Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and 12 other members or 12 other ministers. 
Key members of the organized private sector will also be part of the council, including uh, for a period of one year, subject to the president directive, and they include Alaji Aliko Dangote, Ms. Tony Lumelu, Alaji Abdul Samad Rabiu, and Ms. Amina Mena, amongst others. The formation of these teams, according to the statement, will complement existing economic governance structures, including the National Economic Council, which is chaired by the Vice President. The Economic Management Team Emergency Task Force, on the other hand, will replace, which replaces the Economic Management Team for the time being, is mandated to submit a comprehensive plan of the economic intervention for 2024 to the PECC. And that is going to be our focus of conversation. This particular team put together. So we need to get used to the terms. Now, PECC, uh, the Presidential Economic uh, Coordinating Council, and the tax team as well, put together uh, by the president, chaired by him, and bringing the members of the private sector to see how we can find an answer to some of the economic challenges the country is facing. We're being joined on the program by an economist to make sense of this particular new move by the federal government we been joined in the program by Mr. Kelvin Emmanuel. Mr. Kelvin Emmanuel, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon to you, too. I'm sure by now you should be trying as much as possible to get familiar with the new names, the PECC, as well as uh, uh, the EEC. Uh, but help us understand what difference this council and tax force will make to our economic fortune. I'm not very optimistic about uh, the council. Look, the president can form 10 councils as far as I am concerned and appoint naive Nigerians in the diaspora who are doing well in international organizations. The, the point, the central theme of economic reforms, especially when you consider that the Central Bank of Nigeria in the last quarter has done extremely well to tighten monetary policy, to fight inflation, is raised the monetary policy by a total of about um, um, 600 basis points or 6%. And you can see that the exchange rate is responding to that. But that comes, of course, at the risk of like um, the balance sheet of the commercial banks, you know, exploding. The non performing loan ratio of the commercial banks going above the weighted average that the Central Bank of Nigeria recommends, you know, and the non performing loan book. And then the asset quality of the banks and the total risk weighted assets versus the total capital, which determines the capital adequacy of banks. You know, this is the risk of you raising um, interest rates to try to fight inflation. So it's now for the fiscal side to do the work. It's not about you forming the presidential economic council. The president Buhari did it, and yet we saw where he landed us. It's about you, you know, implementing the reform that has been proposed. The um, presidential um, the kind of committee on fiscal reforms proposed reforms that the president has still not not implemented. It proposed that the tax code is harmonized to not more than 10. Um, the chairman of the Federal Revenue Service has said that it's going to be nine when, of course, the National Assembly ratifies like change to the tax code that governs the activities of the Federal Land Revenue Service and the state land revenue services across Nigeria. Um, the fact that Nigeria has the highest um, unit production cost um, for crude oil in the world at $48.71 per barrel. In Iraq, for example, where uh, um, they've been fighting a civil war since 2002, when the World Trade Center was bombed and the US uh, NATO invaded the Middle East, um, production cost per barrel is $10.57. So it's, 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 it, these are the important questions the president has to call his cabinet to ask, the Minister of Petroleum, the Minister of Gas, ask them why is NMPC not going for forensic audit and going for um, IPO to raise capital to fund projects like NMGP, like um, floating LNG, like um, becoming an operator offshore so you can rely less on um, joint oil agreements and production sharing contract and increase how much you get, you know, considering you have a lot of encumbrances to the amount of crude oil that NMPC gets net today of a little around 700,000 barrels per day. You know, these are the questions the president needs to ask. Why have you not transferred NMPC to an asset manager? Um, like the Ministry of Finance Incorporated or Ministry of Petroleum Incorporated, you know, so that they can, you know, implement what they need to implement as an asset manager to ensure that the federal government, which is the largest shareholder, maximizes value. Where the government-owned enterprises, especially in oil and gas, still under the control of NNPC, like um, um, West African Gas Pipeline Company, of which the Nigerian government owns about 29%, and NLNG, 
of which Nigerian government owns 49 percent? These are the questions because oil and gas is your cash cow. It's it contributed about 89 percent to um, revenues that the government got. Uh, oil and gas is your cash cow. So if you are not um, asking critical questions that is necessary for you to unlock revenue and reduce the amount of deficit financing in the budget and reduce the amount of debt servicing and reduce the reliance on um, central bank overdraft, which is a major part of the crisis that Nigeria found itself in the, itself in terms of exchange rate and inflation, you know, um, that we have today. Then there is no point in setting up a presidential economic council. It's just of no value. So there's another question because you've talked about raising revenue. I remember the last administration, the minister of finance consistently said um, our debt to GDP is fair, is okay. Uh, we don't have this issue. We have revenue problem. And now this administration has come in to put in this very strong policy. Some say it's brutal, necessary. Some say the timing is wrong, the management is wrong, talking about fuel subsidy and floating of uh, uh, the foreign exchange market and all of that. But we're seeing more numbers in terms of uh, how much is accruing to the Federation account. But we're now seeing commensurate productivity. So tell us how this makes sense eventually. What was the point of initial? Well, to be honest with you, I have seen people say that well, the president shouldn't have floated it. Yes, I agree to the extent where, as at the time the president announced that they were going to have a managed float at the inauguration last year, the reality is that the Central Bank of Nigeria had revaluation losses of over 10 trillion naira. That's the reality that um, it's going to be difficult for the government to acknowledge in public, you know, and these FX forwards and swaps in revaluation losses it has means that you floating the exchange rate through a managed float, you know, automatically bumps the amount of debt that um, the losses that the Central Bank of Nigeria is saddled with. It also affected subnationals or state governments. Because, for example, Lagos State that has about $3.3 .3 billion in external loans, the revaluation losses affected not just the principal, it also affected the interest that it pays to the creditors, you know. So I agree to that extent that the, the president should have consulted the Central Bank of Nigeria so that he knows that their balance sheet position before making the decision. But the reality is that the Nigerian government did had net negative reserve as at this time last year mm. to you know defend currency. If you set a peg for a currency, you need to provide the reserves, not gross reserves. What the central bank quotes at $34 billion is gross. Gross is what you have in total minus your encumbrances. Your encumbrances means that today were net positive about a billion dollars. In my opinion, it was negative, you know, before all the loans that they got to be able to stabilize mm. and uh, pay up the valid forward uh, um, for, for banks, LCs, and all the rest of them, you know. So it, the reality is that you cannot defend a peg and you cannot continue to provide subsidy, especially when you consider that the true north of daily consumption of PMS in Nigeria is half of what the last government had at 66 million barrels per day. Uh, so, sorry, 66 million liters of petrol per day. The true north is anywhere around 33, 35 million liters of petrol per day. You know, so you need to go from DSDP to PPSA to be able to find the true north of production. You need to supply the domestic commercial refineries with petrol. It's, it's an um, anomaly that Dangote is operating, but he is having to import heavy crude from America to be able to meet up with the capacity utilization that is targeted right now for the license to operate LTO. So I, I don't support the idea that, oh, we should have postponed removal of fuel, fuel subsidy or postponed the floating the currency because the government was in debt. The government had net negative reserve. The government didn't have money. It had an empty treasury to support that position. Okay, so let's look forward now um, to some of the things. Consistently, they've said, especially economists like you, I'm not saying you in particular, but those within the fiscal space and all of that, say, so look, this is a temporary burden we need to bear. It's a pain we need to bear for the moment because it's a bright future. The projection we can see in the assumption, for instance, sounds like a tall order. When we look at the numbers, 31.7% in terms of headline inflation, some are saying it's way beyond that, that we need to look at our parameter in terms of collecting of data to really know how to reflect this as positively as pos as as truthfully as possible, uh, but the central bank governor uh, and everybody in the fiscal space seem to be aspiring to get back to 21%. So, with what is going on now, do you see a better economic outlook in the next, say, four years? I, I actually see a better economic outlook in four years. As a matter of fact, I think it's going to take the president four to five years if they continue with this pace of reforms. 
and if the fiscal side can also pull their weight because the monetary side is pulling their weight and in my opinion um, while they're doing leaving um, all the bulk on the cbn to manage inflation is just not sustainable because it's only so much you can do continue um, continually and trying to tighten the money supply and raise NPR to align with inflation to interest yield curve. There, there is there's a negative side of, of that that is going to be catastrophic if it's not properly managed and the fiscal side doesn't step up. But over the next four to five years, I honestly think that we're going to come back to between four and 4.5% 4 um, um, GDP growth rates. Uh, this 2024, I expect that GDP growth rate is not going to exceed 3.5%. Uh, population is growing at 3%. I think um, over the next four years, our interest on GDP, interest um, of, of debt on GDP is going to come below 30%, which is a fiscal um, responsibility um, um, standard level. Um, I also expect that the debt to GDP ratio is going to come below 32%. You know, I think inflation is going to drop over the next four to five years below 25%. It's going to um, you know, settle around between 18 and 20 so, 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 Sorry, so by, uh, but so... It is for you, what you just said now, I just want to pick on what you said now. It is too much of hope to expect that inflation will come to the assumption of the government. Is that what you're saying in the next one year? The problem is that the fiscal authorities, the Minister of Agriculture, the Nigerian Agricultural Development Fund, you know, the Minister of Water Resources, that are saddled with the responsibility of, you know, doing backward integration, of providing irrigation for both dry and wet season farming, of providing fertilizer at reasonable prices, providing um, um, all the infrastructure that you need, you know, land opening and all the infrastructure that you need, providing hybrid seeds right. to ensure that you go back to farm, you know, and increase production output, not just for smallholder farmers, but also for mechanized agriculture in the northwest and northeast, central, and not doing their job the way you expect them to do their job. So, uh, also, you, you, you look at the basket for inflation, it's energy and it's food. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is the Minister of Petroleum Resources, the Minister of Gas Resources, the GCU of the NNPC, right. what are they doing to ensure the commercial refiners and right. the refiners in Nigeria have crude oil fee stock to be able to refine and remove the landing cost for bringing petroleum products so right. that the energy prices right. can come down as it impacts inflation? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. That's why I said the fiscal authorities are not pulling their weight like the CBN is. Okay, okay. Uh, absolutely. Uh, quite insightful, you said. But we don't have the luxury of that. I want to thank you, Mr. Kelvin Emanuel, economist, uh, as well as, as coming through at a very short notice, I must say. Thank you so much. But we hope that all of these things will play out. Apparently what you're saying is that there are so many moving parts to all of this, which is why we probe and ask those questions that look, uh, how can we get out of this some form of quagmire? Thank you, Mr. Kelvin Emanuel. Thank you for having me. As I move on to other stories, uh, President Bola Tinubu says Nigeria is deepening democracy by adherence to the rule of law and expediting sustainable provision of good governance, justice and fairness to all Nigerian citizens. President Tinubu made the affirmation when he received a delegation from the United States Congress led by Senator Cory Booker at the State House in Abuja. He asserted that while democracy must be defended, it must translate into quality health care, good education, food security, shelter, and overall economic prosperity for the people of Nigeria. The Nigerian leader told the U.S. congressional delegation that the United States should consider upscaling critical development programs to strengthen ties with the continent. Speaking afterwards, Senator Booker noted that Nigeria and the United States are partners bound by shared values of democracy, rule of law, and commitment to peace and good governance. You know, this partnership is so vital to the United States of America. We are kindred spirits in our commitment to democracy and to human rights and to security. And Nigeria is uh, perhaps one of the world's uh, greatest countries because of its size, because of its population, uh, because of its regional importance. And of course, your president is head of ECOWAS, which is extraordinarily vital at this point when we see uh, some of the challenges that are being faced. Well, already we are a country that understands uh, that we have interwoven destinies, and that's why American businesses invest over $5 billion here. 
we want that to grow. Uh, we already make extraordinary investments in public health here. Uh, that partnership is essential because a public health crisis anywhere is a public health crisis everywhere. Uh, but in addition to that, we share values and want to strengthen democracy uh, because we know that a strong Nigerian economy, a strong Nigerian democracy uh, is going to influence the whole continent of Africa and the world. So our partnership has to remain committed to those common values and those ideals. And still with issues around the federal government, the Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Mr. Adela Alaka, says mining licenses in Nigeria will only be issued to persons who have prospective plans for value addition. Mr. Alake gave the condition during a visit to the $600 million iron ore mining and processing facility in Kaduna State. Plans for. We will no longer license any company that wants to engage in a mineral sector without any concrete plans for local value addition. So today's event really is a milestone because it gladdens my heart that here is a company that has obeyed our admonition and has, in very concrete terms, show the whole world what local value addition actually means. It's not just going to cut or mine our iron ore and cut it away, export it away, what we call mines or pit to port. Is now going to process, refine, giving way to multiplier effect of the economy of Nigeria, not of just the immediate environment. <laughs> Myself and the Minister of Trade have gone around and we've seen the massive investment. In fact, it's reputed to be the largest foreign direct investment into the mineral sector in Nigeria. About $600 billion. Dollars. Well, that's the aspiration of everyone. Value addition is critical, so we don't just extract our raw materials and export. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for your time and, of course, your usual company. I'm Jeffrey Ozan. You've been served on lunchtime. <laughs>